uh, really what we're dealing with here is um, uh, what I call discretized data. Okay, um, it's uh, in a way uh, looking at one direction. It's the physical realization of Cartesian analytic geometry. So we're going to take um, uh, data that's coming at us, you know, usually along a time axis in uh, uh, in in the horizontal, and it has some kind of scalar um, some kind of scalar uh, value in the vertical here, um, and you know the horizontal axis could be space, the uh, vertical axis that could be amplitude, or uh, uh, all kinds of things, uh, you know. Particle, ground motion, velocity, uh, all kinds of things, um, and uh, so uh, essentially we're um, we're looking at uh, uh, at a mathematical model of a true uh, physical process, okay, and that has certain uh, that has certain hazards. Um, and which we're going to talk about a bit, but we're going to uh, um, uh, we we got to think first about how we go from the physical world, where uh, at least being uh, uh, ignorant of what's going on at quantum mechanical time scales. Okay, so in terms of femtoseconds. Um, you know, time may not be continuous, but for everything that we're going to deal with, uh, it's absolutely continuous. You know, you can you can get the uh, we're going to consider that you can get the the time um, out to you know an infinite number of infinite precision, absolutely infinite precision, uh, out to the fiftieth decimal place. You know, no problem. We we can have we can have time. And um, and we we can we can write equations for that. You know, we can write closed form equations. You know, you can write the equation for a sine wave, and that gives you a mathematical representation of uh, of that simple you know waveform in uh, in the continuous time domain. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, and likewise, we can we can express the uh, the Fourier transform of that uh, of that sine wave, um, and uh, uh, and we'll talk a lot about uh, you know I'll give you the the Fourier transform equations that we'll use and uh, and we'll we'll think about and look at uh, um, you know a few uh, example representations uh, of uh, you know transformed. Say a transform sine wave in the continuous frequency domain. Okay, um, and and I, I am kind of assuming in this class that that you've you've seen some of that before, uh, and and you've maybe seen and know where to go find in the library, say uh, uh, a reference book that will show you lots of uh, of closed form uh, functions. Uh, and and we'll give you their closed form Fourier transforms. Okay, so I'm assuming that you can go look that up. Um, and uh, you know, I certainly recommend uh, something like uh, 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 on the Wolfram site. Uh, oh shoot, um, is it called Math World? Um, you can find you know lots of equations on there. Um, and in fact, there's a there's an app that I uh, that I use uh, uh, that's uh, that gives you access to that as well. Um, what is that called? <clears throat> it's called Wolfram Alpha, uh, which gives you you know quick a quick way of searching through through Math World. So it's all there, you know. Uh, uh, you'll see, uh, and not just the continuous ones. Um, um, you know, you'll see uh, discrete representations as well. So um, uh, that's uh, um, uh, 
that's a resource that 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 I'm hoping you'll you'll uh, figure out how to get access to and uh, and figure out how to use as you as you grind your way through the uh, homework assignments. Uh, you'll you'll need you'll need to to have some familiarity with the uh, um, with a few uh, Fourier transforms of uh, of of certain things. You know, a few simple things. Uh, this is not a class in in Fourier theory. Um, you know, uh, we're going to take you know the simple part of Fourier theory. And we're going to make a lot of use of it. Okay, so uh, even even if I have to bring you up to speed on 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 what you can do with Fourier transforms and how to do it, um, it's not going to uh, uh, you know we can just do a little bit and uh, and then make a lot of a, a lot out of it. Okay, so so the continuous domain is is up here on this uh, on this top row. The bottom row is the discrete domain. This is where we take the continuous function and we sample it. You know, we don't we don't have represented in our computers the lines in between these these control points uh, that uh, define the function. We only have the control points. Okay. And that makes it discrete. There's a there's a discrete sample of you know whatever function this is, uh, and so we have the discrete time domain, and of course there's also a discrete frequency domain, and um, uh, and to go between them we have a discrete Fourier transform. Um, and whereas you may have you may have have looked at, at the continuous Fourier transform in a class before, I'm kind of expecting this may be your first exposure to the discrete Fourier transform, and some of the amazing properties that it has as an operator. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the. Uh, uh, we'll work with the uh, discrete Fourier transform as a um, as a matrix multiplication. It's a linear operator. Uh, so that's something that you're going to become very familiar with here. Um, wh why do we bother with the discrete domain? Um, well, it's because we have computers that that can only deal with discretized data. Um, back when I was in college, um, one of the professors pulled out uh, his baby of a uh, um, of an analog computer. Uh, which uh, was old then. He'd been nursing it along, you know, for 25 years at that point, um, and uh, and he could he could he could do a Fourier transform with it. He could he could solve uh, certain uh, differential equations, partial differential equations, uh, pretty easily with it, and that was all in the continuous time, continuous frequency domain. Uh, but you know, no one has seen a. Uh, uh, an analog computer um, in uh, 30 years, I'm sure, uh, because uh, um, uh, you know digital computers that deal with discrete data uh, are so powerful and uh, so ubiquitous these days. So, so you know, part of uh, maybe maybe really a full quarter or third of of what we're going to do in this class is get a, a, a solid appreciation for the discrete Fourier transform and what we can do with it. Okay, um, and and this is really an introduction to to what uh, uh, you know. We've got we've got uh, two different domains. Well, really three different domains. No, I'm sorry, four different domains right here. You know, there's continuous time, discrete time, continuous frequency, discrete frequency, right? And and uh, that's the other thing behind this class and, and and a lot of the work that I do. You know, we just get used to jumping between these uh, these different domains, and and we try to figure out, all right, if I've got a sine wave in continuous time, what is that going to look like in discrete time? What does that look like in, in continuous frequency? What does that look like in discrete frequency? Because it's it's true, there is actually a correct, uh, unique. You know, if if I have a unique function in continuous time, uh, it has a unique represent a unique and and non 
non-ambiguous representation in the discrete frequency domain. Okay, as well as as the other as the other uh, two domains. Okay, unique and non-ambiguous. Um, now there are there are functions which uh, can't be Fourier transformed at all. Um, there are functions that can't be sampled. Um, so so you know not all functions uh, share this, but uh, you know there's a lot of useful ones that do, an awful lot of useful ones that do, and th those are the ones we're going to deal with. Okay, and, and we're going to make plenty out of that. Okay, so so you know. If you have your your function in continuous time, you know what is the process to go you know to find the discrete uh, the uh, frequency domain representation of that function. And notice here, there's no arrow that goes back. Actually, I'm sure there is, but I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, um, the way I do it is uh, I'll I'll go through an intermediate domain. I'll take that continuous uh, time function and I'll sample it, you know, like with a digitizer that we have on all of our seismic stations, and I have on every channel of my uh, seismic recorder, and and I get its representation in the discrete time domain, you know, according to, you know, and that's how good is that representation? Well, it's only as good as the Nyquist criterion allows it to be. So we'll have to talk about that. Um, and then I can do a discrete Fourier transform, which is something we'll learn a lot about, to find that discrete frequency domain representation. I can come up with exactly the same discrete frequency domain representation by taking that continuous time domain um, representation. If I if I have it mathematically, if I if I can write down, you know, some kind of almost closed form expression. Then I can apply the the continuous Fourier transform, so basically a bunch of algebra, and and get its continuous frequency domain representation, and I can sample that, okay, and uh, uh, and and I should get exactly the same thing, you know, all of these, uh, and you should be able to, you know, all of these uh, transformations are perfectly accurate. And so you should just be able to go round and round, crosswise, you know, uh, as many times as you like, and you always have the same thing. Okay, uh, mathematically it's the same. Now, you know, it turns out our um, the easiest way that I know of to go from continuous frequency to discrete time is it's called a bilinear transform. We'll talk about it in a few weeks. It's an approximation. So it's in fact it's a pretty terrible approximation, but you know it's still useful sometimes. Um, uh, I'm not going to, going to talk about uh, the way of going from continuous time to discrete frequency, but going the other way, that's you know what what I'm going to assume you already have seen at least somewhere uh, a Fourier series. Fourier series is actually discrete frequency to continuous time transformation. Um, the same sampling theory that applies to continuous time to discrete time also applies to continuous frequency to discrete frequency. And uh, I guess I'm not showing it here, but you know we all know that there is, in 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 addition to there being analog to digital converters, there are digital to analog converters. So uh, uh, you could call it uh, D to A conversion. I guess would be going up along this line, uh, and you could do the same thing here. Okay. Um, and actually, uh, you know, my uh, my slide here is 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 in discrete space. And if I walk up to the screen, I can see the pixels. Okay, but if I stand back from the screen, my my eye does the uh, uh, does the uh, uh, digital to analog conversion just fine. Um, although I, maybe it can be argued that uh, that your eye, since uh, you have a large number, but you know what? Maybe uh, uh, hundred million um, uh, receptors in your eye. That's still a, a, a sampled uh, a sampled data set. Um, and even you know things like colors and, and light levels are not continuous either. They're represented by you know discrete uh, levels of, of of firing frequencies of neurons in your brain. 
So, uh, um, so even even as humans, we really have no way of directly accessing the actual physical uh, world, which is definitely continuous down to the femtosecond anyway. Um, um, so uh, that's uh, uh, that's one thing you should be aware of. Um, okay, now. Uh, there's a very important transform that you may not have heard of yet. Um, it goes from discrete time to continuous frequency. And what it means is that no matter what complicated, bizarre, um, weird, um, noisy, say, discrete seismogram you have, you just need sample data and you can do the Z transform, which uh, hopefully I'll show you is incredibly simple. And you end up with a representation of that incredibly complex um, signal in the continuous frequency domain. Okay, so that's uh, that's an amazing thing, and um, I hope you'll you'll see that uh, um, when you uh, uh, when we start talking about uh, the Z transform. Uh, a couple comments on sampling. Uh, a corollary to Fourier's uh, theories is uh, Shannon's theorem. Uh, if you uh, if you sample at the Nyquist frequency, okay. Uh, in other words, if you don't have anything in the continuous data, if there is if there are no frequencies above your Nyquist frequency, which is related to your sampling frequency. Then Shannon's theorem says you do have a mathematically, logically complete description of that of that time series. Okay, so so if you hold to the Nyquist criterion, you don't lose any information. Okay, and that's that's you know it's a big caveat. Uh, um, you know, holding to Nyquist criterion is sometimes. Um, quite difficult. It used to be difficult to do in time, and it's still exceedingly difficult to do in space. You know, we, we sample in space as well as time. You know, we sample in space by putting a geophone down, okay? And if we if we put you know a geophone down at intervals, that means we're making a certain sampling of space that is uh, uh, that will imply a certain Nyquist spatial frequency, okay, and uh, uh, you know how would you how would you raise your your Nyquist frequency in time if you're recording data like on our like on our bison? What would you what would you do? You know you want to you want to up the the frequency of the of the uh, uh, of the of the discrete data that that it can What's represent. The well, let's let's say you talk. Let's talk first about time frequency. So, so what do you have to do to up the time frequency? Exactly, exactly. And and actually, on the yeah, you know, the seismograph, it's on the bison. It says sample rate, but it's actually the sample interval in time. So you go to a small. You know, you just make a. You know, it's like a few button pushes on the on the seismograph, right? And what do you have to do to sample uh, to sample? Uh, at a higher spatial frequency uh, for spatial sampling. Right, and if I want the same, you know, range of offsets, say, or to cover the same distance on the ground, what does that mean? Right, and is that is that as easy, you know, if you have twice as many geophones to put on in, is that as easy as uh, um, as just turning up the sample rate on the seismograph? Yeah. <laughs> no way. <laughs> right. It's it's real work, right? Or 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 let's say you you want to turn up the uh, spatial sampling of sources, then you're then you're having to you know wield the sledgehammer at twice as many places. That's a lot of work. Um, and and uh, but but the benefits of of increased spatial sampling are so great. You know the the limitations we've suffered from from inadequate spatial sampling are are so bad. In other words. That uh, there are uh, a lot of um, there's a lot of economic motivation to, um, uh, to to 
to uh, to do that work. Okay, so uh, a typical um, oil survey, oil seismic reflection survey, in um, uh, say over a large field. Okay, and this is you know virtually all the country of Oman on the Arabian Peninsula has been explored this way now. Um, a typical survey will have a uh, a geophone a channel spacing of um, of uh, just a few meters, okay. It will and and there will be the survey. You know, might might cover a hundred square miles, and um, and it will be made. Uh, and this and the geophones in both directions will be uh, will be spaced at a few meters, and the um, and there will be twenty thousand channels live, okay. And they will send. You know, the, the, they will also make the vibrators usually will be uh, sent around to, uh, you know, a quarter as many points as geophones occupy, you know, because that's what's going to, you know, that really, you know, fielding 20,000 geophones is not easy, but it's a lot easier than, uh, than fielding uh, 20,000 vibrator uh, 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 impact points. Okay, so um, they might cut that back to, to 4,000 or 5,000. They'll use twice the spacing. Uh, and so they'll they'll have a quarter as many vibrator points, um, uh, but still, um, you know they they have uh, uh, you know huge numbers of uh, of this, and and naturally they get out you know multi uh, uh, multi tens of terabyte data sets, and and they're trying to process these huge data sets now with uh, computers that have twenty thousand cores. And that's the uh, so that's the challenge now is actually and 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 I'm actually going to touch on some of these computational science issues. The um, uh, the problem with it's it's relatively easy now to uh, to build a computer with twenty thousand cores. Um, there's relatively more places that can house it and operate it. The trouble is how to get those cores working together efficiently. To, to process your data in less than infinite time, um, so that's the big that's the big computational science challenge right now, um, because uh, you know we we've we've learned a lot about how to uh, how to process data with a few hundred cores, um, but when you get to twenty thousand, the uh, you know the ways we had of making a few hundred cores efficient just doesn't don't work anymore. Uh, so, so it's turning out that the, the whole uh, field of, of seismic exploration has, has probably in the last five years, um, you know, the operating the, the, the uh, geophysical service companies have, I mean, they have they have made more progress than the last hundred years in terms of killing that uh, um, that spatial aliasing, uh, and 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 they've been wanting to do that because. The the they're able to you know by getting more detailed images and being able to target the the drilling more better and uh, and to um, uh, better understand the reservoirs uh, it's really been worth it so you know one of these twenty thousand channel live surveys might cost uh, fifty million dollars but a single um, a single um, failed well. Uh, could cost uh, um, well. It's going to cost at least twenty million dollars, and uh, uh, and one of these uh, one of these giant fifty million dollar surveys is going to, you know, that's going to lead to you know the drilling of probably a hundred wells. So if you can if you can only drill fifty wells instead of a hundred, then you've saved an enormous amount. So that's where that's where this is has come from. You know, there's plenty of economic. Um, Plenty of economic uh, motivation here these days. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, all right. So Shannon's theorem, um, you know, actually provides the motivation for uh, um, for all this work. Um, you know, uh, these uh, these service companies that are getting these. Uh, you know, fifty million dollar contracts to do these giant surveys. They got to hire a lot of geophysicists to to look at the data and make sure it's acceptable quality. So, 
there are some great job opportunities there that uh, our graduates have been taking advantage of. Um, you know, and, and also, uh, you know, with all that hiring of geophysicists, they, you know, there's, and, and with people in my generation and earlier uh, starting to retire, um, there's, there's more and more faculty jobs for, uh, you know, for people who want to get PhDs. So, uh, you know, this, this exact field, you know, what I'm talking about, it is booming right now. Um, it has been very cyclic in the past. I can't promise it won't go down, but if you look at uh, you know oil consumption in uh, uh, in China and India and how that has uh, you know quintupled in the last ten years, um, I, I can't see the price of oil coming down to twenty dollars a barrel again, uh, and that's the point where where the jobs all go away. Okay, um, most companies now are developing. Um, Fields where they can they can explore and uh, uh, and develop and pump oil for uh, uh, sixty five dollars a barrel and uh, I don't know when was the last time the actual price of oil was down to sixty five dollars a barrel uh, it was a while ago <laughs> so you know we've got huge uh, a huge bump in well a huge bump in in uh, natural gas production in the United States a huge bump even more lately in oil production in the United States, um, you know, and, and any, anything to avoid that, that horribly dirty Canadian uh, tar sand oil um, would be good. Um, and, you know, burning that's almost like burning coal in terms of carbon production. So it's, uh, it's like three times better to burn uh, some nice uh, American shale oil from, uh, 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 from North Dakota. Um, yeah, um, it's a it's a it's a fantastic world out there right now. Um, opportunities galore. Um, you know, if you're the one who can figure out how to uh, how to process data, you know, say even fifty percent faster with twenty thousand cores, you know, you've got you've got the root of a of a huge startup company. You know, great that that would be great. Um, if you can figure out a way to um, uh, to uh, you know, plant geophones twenty five percent faster, or or uh, or you could build a cheaper vibrator that you can you know for the same price field twice as many. Um, boy, that would also be a you know you'd make a hundred million in, in uh, five years. Um, so uh, there's there's huge motivation now for great ideas. Um, uh, uh, you know, if you uh, if you can improve the geological models for uh, for certain districts where the oil is higher quality with less sulfur, um, you know, and, and uh, burns without damaging the environment so much, um, then uh, uh, you know you could have a consultancy that that will make you a million dollars a year. Uh, lots of opportunity. Okay, so um, there are actual actually. Um, in our heads, there are two ways that we get our seismograms or our time series data. Okay, um, and uh, the first way that I'm going to talk about is called the physical model. Okay, um, and basically, uh, and 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 if you've done, um, if you've looked at earthquake seismograms and done any, certainly done any seismogram inversion, you're very familiar with this. The data y, so y is a time series, and that's what's recorded at the uh, at the uh, seismometer. It's equal to a uh, a convolution. That's what this uh, that's what this uh, star means. Uh, it's a convolution of some input x with a filter f. Okay, so you take uh, an input like a source time function, earthquake source time function. And you uh, you convolve it with a uh, filter, which might be the uh, uh, the, the uh, propagation process of the seismic wave, and that gives you the the recorded data. Okay, that can you know that can be an exploration, that could be in earthquakes, uh, it can be in photography, uh, all kinds of things. But the, the the physical model is based on this concept of the filter f and the convolution. 
Okay. Um, so we have the x input, and you know inputs uh, are subject to noise. So there there could be some so-called convolutional noise that's added to the input, and then we convolve with the filter f. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, and then you know right at the right at the geophone right at the seismic station there will be some additional noise, and uh, uh, we like to think of that as as additive noise. Uh, it just gets uh, uh, added to you know after convolution, and that produces the seismogram output. Okay, I'm being I'm being you know. This physical model works with all kinds of time series, you know, GPS signals, uh, everything. Um, but um, uh, you know, I'm going to keep going to uh, the earthquake and exploration seismology for uh, as as I talk about it. Okay, now uh, let me go explicitly more towards the uh, the exploration, uh, the assumptions we use in in seismic reflection exploration. Okay. Uh, the input x um, is not an earthquake source time function. It's a random spike sequence that uh, basically says how deep and how strong the reflectors are in the Earth. Okay, so this is uh, parallel to the modeling you might have seen of seismograms in in uh, um, programs like OpenDetect and uh, um, uh, and Kingdom. Okay. So the random spike sequence, you know, there, you might uh, look at the sonic log and you say, all right, you know, at these formation boundaries, there's this much difference in the average, uh, in the average, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the average uh, sonic transit time, and uh, and so we're going to see a reflection coefficient of about, you know, 0.05, you know, five percent. And um, but there's only so many uh, you know unlike the continuous sonic log there's only so many formation boundaries that you're going to bring into this so you have a limited number of reflectors it's uh, what I call uh, parsimonious okay there's only so many spikes in your in your uh, input okay um, so that's uh, uh, that's a, one of the one of the assumptions on the input here uh, f Okay, that's the wave coming out of the uh, out of the explosion. So we're 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 not talking about fiber size yet. We're talking about you know a hammer blow or a um, uh, or a uh, uh, an explosion. Okay, for land seismic, um, we're not quite talking. Uh, we're talking about uh, maybe um, we're not talking about the chirp device that uh, Graham uses in lakes. Um, uh, we'll we'll discuss that later too. We're talking about uh, maybe what, what a sparker would yield in uh, in the marine environment, okay? And and what we call these waves that come right out of explosions or hammer blows or sparkers, um, that's known as minimum phase. In a few weeks, I'm going to define minimum phase uh, for you until you're blue in the face. So um, um, we'll we'll learn more about minimum phase. Okay? So that's the source wavelet. And that that could be complicated, you know. Even uh, especially, you know, if you hit the hammer and move your feet, right? Then the source wave coming out of the hammer area is complicated by moving the feet, or or uh, you know, there's the double bounce, right? When you bounce uh, uh, bounce the hammer on the plate, um, you know, uh, that that interferes with the quality of the record. Could we could we account for that? Could we take that out? You know. Um, because we're assuming that the reflectors are, are are parsimonious, and you know, as you go down into the ground, the reflectors are parsimonious. But the uh, the source source wavelet we're allowing to be complicated, okay? And then the output is our is our simple reflection seismogram, okay? So uh, you know, sep uh, taking the output and separating x from y, right? I mean, it's it's like taking the output and factoring it, okay? Uh, I'm sorry. Separating x from f, um, you know, that's uh, uh, and we're given the data y. Uh, we call it deconvolution. And uh, likewise, in in uh, uh, earthquake seismology, you know, you would be uh, 
your input x might be the earthquake source time function. And so decon deconvolution would be, uh, would be separating the source time function from the, uh, the propagation effects. Um, so uh, deconvolution applies very well to there. And, uh, uh, but you know, we get the data by a process of filtering and convolution. So deconvolution, thus, we can define as a process of inverse filtering. How do you invert a filter? How do you invert a deconvolution? Well, that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Okay, um, and uh, uh, it's a uh, it is a, a process of integration. Um, we're going to take a quasi uh, analytic approach to it, um, and then the uh, the non analytic approach, the inversion approach to it, or the um, the iterative approach to it will, uh, uh, I'll, I'll take that, I'll hint at it, but I'll take it mostly in, um, uh, in 757. Okay. Um, another thing that, that uh, you may have heard of is, is wave shaping. Uh, you know, the, the data that, uh, that you're looking at, Tyler, from uh, Soda Lake, it's, been, it's all been shaped, so it's, uh, um, it's a zero phase wavelet, right? It probably says that right in the specification, you know, somewhere uh, of the of the processing, uh, and that's related. Uh, you know, you you can apply a filter um, and go through that process of wave shaping. And we're going to find out, you know, along the way of learning about filtering and convolution, deconvolution, we're also going to learn about wave shaping. Okay. Now, there's another process. Um, another way of getting our data. And, and again, these are just in our heads. These are representations of, you know, these are theories for how we can, how we can get the data. This is called the statistical model. And there is no physics here. Okay. Um, and when my classmates and I learned about this in the early 80s, uh, a lot of my classmates, you know, kind of took off and, and, uh, uh, started to see if they could apply the statistical model to the time series, which is say uh, the the Dow Jones uh, versus time. And uh, I, I think at least one of my classmates actually became a uh, uh, you know one of these derivative stock broker uh, uh, geniuses and, and actually uh, made some money uh, as a result of of this. So so you know the it's it's. Well, there are economists who, who construct uh, uh, phys you know, convolutional physical type models for the stock market or, or other economic indicators. Um, but most of them have worked uh, off this statistical model. Um, and, and there's no physics here. This is just a pure mathematical construct. Uh, and uh, so you know, it might work in, uh, in stocks. Uh, and you know some some smart uh, physicists, geophysicists, electrical engineers have made money in stocks working for big brokerages, um, at least when it was possible to make money in stocks. <laughs> A few of them still are, I think. Um, uh, and and it's worth considering: can we apply the statistical model to our physical data? But by applying the statistical model, we're admitting right off the bat that we're not considering physics. Okay, we're just looking at at the seismogram, you know. Uh, and, and here, here I, you know, x is a is a is a time series, and I'm telling you with the sub the subscript t here that the time series is, um, uh, I mean, sorry, that the that the data series is a time series, so it's x depending on t. Um, and, uh, uh, and we're going to further call it a seismogram. So uh, we're going to assume that it has this property of stationarity. We're going to assume it's stationary. In other words, the method of generating that, uh, that wave doesn't change with time. Uh, now that, that, of course, for a seismogram, we know that's not true, right? You see the P wave come in. That's you know, one way of, you know, that generates one type of Appearance of the seismogram, and then the you know later the uh, the LG waves will come in or something, and that's a very different way. 
you know, the and the statistical properties change a lot. Um, but uh, seismologists still use the, the statistical model a lot uh, when they, uh, you know, they might cut out, say, just the S wave, and they'll do a statistical uh, model analysis of the S wave of one seismogram versus the S wave on another seismogram. So it is possible even to 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 uh, make this stationary uh, uh, assumption um, uh, in. Uh, uh, the stationary assumption, uh, even with with physical seismograms. Um, the other uh, the other uh, um, assumption that we that we make uh, beyond stationarity is uh, is that the the signal is ergodic, and and all that means here is that it has limited energy, so it's going to die with time. It's not going to increase with time. So of course, if you if you if you take if you snip out the part of the wave that goes from um, you know, from from noise to uh, a big LG wave pulse, you know that's that's that little snippet is not ergodic, but if you just cut out the LG from from its its inception, you know, and watch it die away, then that snippet would be ergodic. Okay, so um, and and here's the heart of the physical model. Um, that if 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 we knew, if we had a way of knowing these alphas. Right, and there's a whole bunch of alphas here. There's a whole bunch of, of auto regression coefficients, is what they're called. Okay, and we have the history of the, uh, you know, let's say we're we're predicting the stock market. Okay, so we want to predict, uh, uh, you know, tomorrow's uh, uh, Dow Jones, so we can put in our buy and sell orders. Okay, so that's uh, T is equal to tomorrow. Okay. So this is this is actually one sample of the series. This is tomorrow's Dow Jones X sub T, and uh, and this is uh, you know uh, T minus one. That's today's Dow Jones. Okay, T minus you know K equal two would be uh, yesterday's Dow Jones. Okay, uh, so we have the whole history of the of the time series, and we want to make a prediction in the future. All right, if we had these alphas, then this simple summation would do it. Okay. Now you have to got to watch out for the noise. Okay. Um, you know, there's uh, in any in any data set there is uh, there is noise that is not predictable, and of course the uh, the people who've made money on on stocks using theory like this uh, have found you know whatever data series it is that is not you know ninety percent Z. Right. If your data set is ninety percent Z, you're going to do poorly. Okay, ninety percent noise. So they they found some data set that is not, you know, dominated by the noise, and uh, and it, so if you can figure out those auto regression co coefficients alpha, then you've got it. You you can, you know, just use a simple procedure. You can predict the next time point, and you can go, you know, then you can keep going in the, into the future. Right, because the statistics, the the you know these alphas are not going to change, you know under the assumptions. It's it's uh, it's stationary. It's ergodic. Um, so uh, uh, you know this is uh, uh, the simplest possible form of this, um, and uh, uh, you know it's assuming the predictive the predictable part that's covered by the uh, uh, the summation here. Is uh, you know most of it, most of the signal, and the noise, uh, which is z, is uh, is not most of the signal. So uh, uh, that's and, and and as you can see, there's no physics here, you know. And I'm also not saying much about how you how you get those uh, those auto regress auto regression coefficients alpha. And you can look that up on uh, uh, in Wolfram and and. You'll see, there's uh, you know vast uh, there's a whole world of, of theories and practices out there for getting those. Uh, some of them are quite standard. Um, so that's that's you know that's where that's where it's at. Uh, if you can get these alphas somehow, then uh, then you can predict your series. Okay, and, the, and it's just all math. This is statistics. This is not this is not uh, physics. Um, there's uh, the application of this in geophysics. Uh, you know, there's some 
there's some time-tested uh, 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 ways of getting these uh, alpha coefficients uh, called uh, maximum entropy uh, spectral analysis. Um, uh, MEM, uh, there's a uh, famous algorithm called uh, the, the Berg algorithm, named after, uh, oh, what's his first name? I met him once. Um, uh, you know, the inventor, his name is Berg, and he was a geophysicist. So, um, uh, you know, there, it, it's, it's not uh, unreasonable to, uh, to do this. It can be quite useful. Uh, okay, so now uh, um, uh, another topic, I'm, I'm going to allude to it here, and we're not really going to, uh, to make much use of it in, uh, in this class. But uh, let me set it up anyway, and you'll see where I'll be going in 757. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to take a stab at it this semester, um, but, uh, but we're not going to get very far until 757. Um, one of our objectives is to solve this kind of system. And, and this really gets back to the, uh, uh, well, actually, this, this applies to either the physical model or the statistical model. Okay. Maybe uh, we want those uh, alpha um, uh, prediction coefficients. Okay. Maybe we want to do a deconvolution and find x. Okay, uh, under the physical model, right? Uh, so uh, we have some kind of um, some kind of linear operator, uh, which for a physical model is going to be uh, uh, in general a Fréchet difference kernel, and uh, we. Uh, uh, we multiply that matrix by the uh, the column vector, which is a, the uh, the model parameters, and that multiplication gives us a column vector, which is a uh, uh, a uh, uh, a data uh, a seismogram. Okay. Uh, okay. So these column vectors are just the matrix way of thinking about uh, uh, time series, right? So certainly the y the column vector can be a time series. Or you know, it could just be a column vector of of those uh, uh, those uh, uh, prediction coefficients alpha. Okay, so it's generalized this way. So uh, you know what we want to do is we have y. We might we might have uh, a, some good insight into a. You know whether it's physical or statistical model, and so the problem is to get x. Okay. Simple matrix inversion problem, right? Trouble is, is that our, our our geophysical data are virtually always um, very much underdetermined. Okay, we you know we might have we might have actually um, you know fifty terabytes of of data, but it's still going to be an underdetermined problem. Okay, and uh, uh, you know. How to observe that? How to how to quantify it? How to describe it? That's one of the topics of 757. Okay, one of the ways of, of, of observing this is to use uh, uh, eigenvector eigenvalue analysis. And um, uh, what we uh, what we typically end up with uh, in geophysics, you know, whether it's a statistical or physical model, is that A here has lots of zero eigenvalues. Okay, if we if we do a decomposition, an eigenvalue decomposition. We'll find it's got lots of zero eigenvalues, so we can only estimate part of it. Okay, we can estimate a an approximation, which I'll in in a lot of my notes I call x hat. Okay, so we 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 want to get the model x. Okay, and and x hat is the uh, is the part of the model that we can that we can uh, you know get some sense of, and then you know. There's an indeterminate part x naught. That could be anything, okay. Um, and uh, one thing that we will examine this semester is that this part that we can determine, you know, and I, you know, and I'm not going to say yet until I see the problem. I don't know whether it's you know a tenth of a percent that we can determine, or 99 percent. Don't know yet. You know, you bring me the problem. Let's let's see. Okay, but whatever we can determine. It's going to have Heisenberg uncertainties. So this semester we will describe those those Heisenberg uncertainties, uh, and that's actually the subject of uh, Lab Four. 
So uh, in 77, I do go into the iterative estimation of x. Uh, and um, and we, we, we typically, instead of actually inverting a or doing the normal equations and inverting, uh, uh, well, OK. So instead of actually inverting a, we, uh, we make use of the conjugate of a, which I call a prime. Okay. Um, and it's both the uh, um, both the the transpose and the complex conjugate of a, okay, and uh, uh, and that turns out to be a much more stable um, process than trying to find a inverse. And right there is the heart of the reason that one of the textbooks that I'm referring to, the 1990 textbook of Clairbout's is called processing versus inversion. Okay? And um, processing is using this, this A transpose, A conjugate, and inversion is using A inverse. Okay? And it just boils down to that. Okay? So in 757, I'll show you that you know, getting A transpose is not only useful, it's also much, much easier than getting A inverse. Um, so uh, uh, that uh, uh, I'll talk about that uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'll just mention it, and uh, and then we'll go on with our with our sample time series and Z transform uh, analysis. Okay.